am so excited to be here today. Um, and so are they. They're really excited to be here. Uh, in sync, you guys have been practicing, haven't you? It's great. Um, so I mentioned, for those of you who just walked in, um, I do encourage questions throughout the presentation. Um, so please feel free to ask them. Uh, you can ask them by using that link. If you see other people's questions, you want to upvote them because you like them, or if you have questions, feel free to do that. Um, and again, the lovely Deb Ram, who's helping me out here today, uh, like dragged into this yesterday. I think I asked you to do this for me, so very appreciative. But, but it's also extra helpful that Deb is here because um, my uh, my emphasis is, is secondary. My school teacher, I'll get into that in a second. Um, Deb is an elementary expert, so if you are an elementary educator um, and you have questions specific to that, she'll be able to to kind of help address some of those questions. Um, so who am I? Uh, I am a math teacher. Yes, how many math teachers in the house? Um, I am currently teaching at Barrington High School in Rhode Island. I've been there, I just finished my 10th year at Barrington High School. Um, Barrington is a affluent community. Uh, it's a very high performing, um, generally in math, especially considered to be top in the state. So very high performing, intense school. Um, before that, I taught in New York City public schools at the middle and high school level. So to say that I've kind of seen both ends of the spectrum of what a classroom can look like is a bit of an understatement. Um, I love both the time. What I say to people is teaching is hard no matter what, but teaching in New York was a different job. Um, I felt like on, at the end of almost every day, I felt like someone hit whacked me over the head with a knife. So uh, I can appreciate all kinds of classrooms is sort of the point. Um, I'm a technology nerd and a math teaching nerd. So, wow, is this the place to be for me, right? I mean, um, you know, most of my life I spent loving technology and sort of waiting for it to catch up with my teaching nerd side. Um, and the last few years have been really exciting for me because they are merging together really nicely. Um, and, and, I, and I should qualify that by saying, I really don't think you need to be a technology nerd at all. You need to be a teaching nerd who can do a little bit of tech. We don't need tech nerds who can teach, we need teaching nerds who can tech. So don't be intimidated by the technology. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit as we go. Um, I'm also a FUSE RI fellow. You can learn more about the FUSE Fellowship. Um, Rhode Island is doing great things. Eric Rutesh in the back, pumping his fist. Um, FUSE, uh, FUSE RI is all about um, promoting blended learning throughout the state of Rhode Island. So we partner with other districts and share ideas. And that's how I know Deb. She's a fellow fellow. Um, so that's a really cool program. Um, I'm also a Teach Plus Education Policy Fellow. I'm starting that, just started that a couple months ago. Um, the goal of that fellowship is to get teachers at the table when legislators are writing education policy. Um, because right now they're not, right? Education <laughs> policy gets written by lots of people, none of whom have any idea what goes on in an actual classroom. So I'm really excited to see where that leads me. Um, so how did I get to where I'm at right now? Um, about four years ago, 2013, I got an iPad, and I started playing around with it. Um, and I got an app, uh, I think I was using Show Me Interactive at the time, just to make little videos. Uh, and I just kind of started playing around with them. And a couple things happened. Um, so the Bebop Burrito story, let's have the Bebop Burrito story. So two of my students were hanging out at Bebop Burrito, which doesn't even exist now, um, and they were studying for a geometry test. And they were stuck on a couple questions. So they sent me an email. I happened to be at home, I happened to see the email, and they said you know, they didn't know how to do this question. So I got on my iPad, made a quick little screencast, explained how to do the problems, <laughs> emailed it to them. 10 minutes later, I got another email. Thank you so much, we totally get it now, this is great. What? That was a real kind of eye-opening moment. Um, the other one, I was also teaching Algebra 2 at the time. And again, playing around the iPad, made a couple videos, just as review, threw them up somewhere and said, hey, they're there if you want. Didn't even know if anyone was looking at him. Uh, a couple days later, Tyler comes in. He's after, after class, he comes up to me. Mr. Appel, I watched your videos last night, and it was amazing. I could pause you. I could rewind you. <laughs> uh, it was, And he was so excited about it, and he started to talk about how when he's in class, he wants to be able to try the problem first. right? If I was going over a problem up in front of him, he wants to try it first. And, and he can't do that in a regular classroom, right? Because he, he has to do what is happening in the classroom. 
Um, so for him, just to be able to pause me, try it himself first, and then watch me explain it was so powerful. He also really struggled with taking notes. He couldn't keep up with taking notes with what I was writing and at the same time be thinking about it. So for him to be able to pause, write things down, and then think about it was life-changing. So when those two things happened, I knew I was onto something. I knew I had to start making some changes. Um, so, so I kind of got at it a little bit there, but I want to just illustrate a little more um, about my, my justification or why you should think about changing. Um, so I started with uh, BYOD. And actually, before we even went BYOD in our district, um, I just kind of went to my principal and said, can I just have some kids bring in some devices so I can try some stuff? And, and I know this is not typical, but my principal said, cool, go for it. Um, so I do understand that you may not be working in a school where you can do that, so maybe you have to just do it and not tell anyone, or whatever you have to do to make it happen. Um, but I started doing that, I started flipping my classrooms, so having the kids watch the videos at home so they could do the work in class. And, and just that alone was such a culture shift, um, because now I was spending more of my class time working with kids one-on-one -on -one and in small groups. And so my interactions with kids changed. I got to know them so much better, so much faster. Um, and, and that was really surprising to me, actually, at the time. Um, that, you know, we've, a lot of the pushback about using technology in our classrooms is kids are sitting on their screens and they need to be interacting with people. <laughs> the exact opposite happened in my classroom. Kids are interacting with each other and with me way more now than they ever could before. There's not much interaction when they're sitting and listening to me talk. There's a lot of interaction when they are talking to each other and working together. Um, so that was kind of transformative. Um, one of the things that I found um, it, when, I, when I started and even now to this day with my current playlist model, um, it's, it's no worse for anybody. There are kids who really like a traditional classroom. My wife, actually, when we talk about this at home, she's an English teacher. Um, she's always saying, you know what, I don't know that I would like your model. I, I was a, she was a really good traditional student, and that's fine. But what I found is kids that were, are successful there can be just successful this way. Um, but it's so much better for some kids, um, like a Tyler, for example. Um, now, I do have to qualify that a little bit. One of the things about this model is it puts the onus on the kids. Um, they can't just sit back and soak it in. So if you have a kid who will literally be obstinate about their learning and sit there and not do anything, and I, I have had that happen. I'm sure you've had a student or two or a hundred like that as well. Um, they're gonna get nothing. They get nothing. I will say the difference is you can sit down one-on-one -on -one and try to find out why they're not doing anything and encourage them to do something and do all the different teacher moves that we do to at least give them a shot to engage in the material. Um, so I just wanted to qualify that. Um, there's a little video there that kind of can show you what blended learning looks like. It's pretty, it's kind of a cool video. I don't want to take the time right now to show it, but you can watch that um, at your own time. Um, and I'm going to kind of get into that. Um, and, and this is, I know this is obvious, but um, you know, I've seen studies that said, that, that look at, oh, putting technology in classrooms doesn't improve learning. Yeah, well, duh. <laughs> right? It's not about the tools. It's about changing what we do. But the, the technology is just a tool to make it easier and more practical, right? We all know differentiation is humanly impossible, right? <laughs> That's just a fact. Um, without some help, without some technology help or other tools that we can use. Okay. Um, maybe I don't have to do this little demonstration at, at ISTE, but maybe I do, and I like to do it anyway. Um, so let's start with raise your hand if you have a smartphone. Okay. okay. Um, what if you had one two years ago? My favorite one. Ten year, more than ten years ago. We just had the ten year anniversary of the iPhone. Anybody? A couple people? What'd you have? I like to ask. Uh, the trio. The trio, yeah. So oh, the Palm one, yeah. Anybody, what do you have? A hand yep, yep. I have one of those too. Yeah. Sidekick. A sidekick? Okay, yeah. Blackberry. A Blackberry, yeah. Um, so uh, ten, just that's just ten years ago, right? Our students, I'm a high school teacher, my students were born. Not you know, they, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. They were telling me their birthdays. I'm like, really? You were all born in the 2000s? No. Oh, wow. I'm old. Um, so anyway, the world is changing, right? The world is changing. Um, this is not a religious statement at all, but I do like this visual. So that was the inauguration of the Pope in 2005. That was the inauguration in 2013. 
looks anything different. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Um, I do like, there's there's that one little flip flop. <laughs> It's doing? Could they take pictures then? <laughs> probably, yeah, it probably took a picture, but it was just a big blur with giant pixels on it, right? Um, right. Our, our, our world is changing. Um, uh, the, the world that our kids, our students are growing up in is not the same one that we grew up in, and we need to change what our classrooms look like. Um, you know, I, I stole that quote from someone, and I'm sorry I'm not, well, it's not that. Part of the thing to have figured out, but the 20, we talk about changing for the 21st century, like 21st century's been here for a while, let's get with it, right? Our, our classroom model, our school model is based on a system well over 100 years old that was designed to prepare kids to go work in factories. It worked really well for that. That's not what we need to be preparing our kids for. We have to do something different. Um, okay, so, so why playlists? Um, there are other models that are out there that you can use, um, and you can explore some of those if you want. Um, but what I like about playlists is the self-pacing. I'm going to get into that a little bit more later, but the self-pacing is huge. Um, it's basically, I probably should have said what I mean when I say a playlist. You'll know when I'm finished, but just a quick overview. A playlist to me is anything that's it's just a list of steps. Do this, then do this, then do this, with some instruction. Right? <laughs> Um, so that instead of having to pace your class by telling them to do each of those steps, they can follow those steps on their own. That change alone is absolutely huge for students. And again, I'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, the other thing is they can do it anytime, anywhere. It's got to be online somewhere. So kids absent. I tried a student last year who had knee surgery. She was out for two and a half weeks. Didn't even email with me. She came back after the surgery. I was like, all right, I'm ready to take my test now. What are you talking about? You've been gone for two and a half weeks. Don't you need to move? She's like, yeah, I have one or two questions, but I'm, I'm ready. And she was fine. Right? Amazing. Right? She was able to access. She said, in the hospital bed, what else is she going to do? <laughs> but do geometry. I mean, of course, you want to do geometry anywhere, anytime, all the time. Um, but playlists allow you to do that. Um, another really powerful part of this is instant feedback. Um, no one should ever, in this day and age, answer a DOK1 question and not know instantly if they did it right. That should never happen. A student should not be practicing something incorrectly and not know it. That can't happen anymore. There's no reason for it to happen. Um, so that's another really powerful part of this. Um, so one way I use the playlist, and this is actually not a typical one, first day of school. You got a lot of information you got to get out to the kids, right? I always used to lose my voice. <laughs> Just talking at them for the you got all the syllabus and the pencils and the notebooks and here's your textbook and all of this junk. Ugh. So I tried making a playlist for that. Um, and this again, this playlist looks a little different than others, but it's also to give you an idea that a playlist can look like anything. A playlist can be a Google drawing with links in it. It can be a list in a Google Doc. I'll, I'll show you what some of them look like. But um, so so this was my first day of school playlist, and so the kids just had to go sort of like a station rotation, except they didn't actually physically have to go anywhere. Um, and so I needed them to sign up for a few different sites. Um, I had a survey. This little survey was my little get to know you. I don't know if any of you do that, but like a little tell me a little bit about yourself. So instead of having them do that on a piece of paper, they do it through a Google form, and then I can go back and take a look at it later. I have all that in there. Um, I made a little video that kind of talked a little bit about um, just what to expect in the class, how to be successful in the class, materials you need, things like that. Um, I put, I threw up in Google Classroom. Um, Having, having them look through the syllabus. Why do I need to sit there and read through the syllabus with them? Ugh, awful, right? Let them read through it and then ask them a couple questions to make sure that they understood what they read. Done. So on day one, all of my kids did everything I needed to, them to do. And if you didn't notice right there in the middle, every single kid came up and had a two or three minute conversation with me. Day one, I got to have a two or three minute individual one-on-one -on -one or small group conversation with every single one of my students. Right? It's about connecting with kids. That's what personalized learning is really all about. Um, and this allows you to do it. Um, so my playlists have evolved a little bit. This is kind of what they looked like initially. Um, it was just a simple Google Doc, numbered list with links in it. It's a great place to start. Um, and if you are one of those who's not super tech savvy or just maybe not as comfortable with getting started, it's a really good place to start. Simple. Um, it's just a list of steps. 
Uh, they can watch, uh, they can grab some, a printed copy of notes if they didn't have them already. I'll talk more about that later too. They can watch a little video, do some online practice problems, whatever it is you want them to be doing, and they can progress through that at their own pace. Um, they're super quick and easy. Um, when you're making these, I'm a huge, I do a whole thing about keyboard shortcuts. <laughs> um, control K is insert a link. You guys know that, it's, that works just about anywhere. So when you're creating links, know those keyboard shortcuts because it makes something that could take 10 minutes in some taking eight or nine minutes, and if you're gonna create a whole bunch of this stuff, saving time, saving time is great. Um, so big fan of keyboard shortcuts. Now, I had some problems with using this model. Um, so what would happen is the kids would, would open up their playlist, and they'd be working through it, and then at the end of the period, they'd be at step three or something like that, and they'd come back the next day, and they didn't remember where they were. Okay. Or they'd be clicking on all these links, and they'd end up with 17 different tabs open, and they'd lose track of what was going on, or their computers would crash, or whatever it was. Um, and it was also impossible, really hard for me, right? So I had data in Edpuzzle, I had data in Khan Academy, I had data all over the place. It was totally unmanageable. Collecting data really isn't very useful if you can't do anything with it. That's what the data is for. That's what formative assessment is about, right? It's doing something with the data. An assessment isn't formative if you don't actually change anything because of it. So this wasn't really working that well for me after a year of using it that way. Um, and I kind of mentioned students struggle to track their progress. So I needed to, to kind of change that a little bit. Um, so now I'm gonna kind of get into what they look like. Um, so that's a link to one, but I'm gonna show you screenshots just because it's easier so I don't have to run back and forth to the computer. Um, so I started using a tool called GoFormative. Um, if you see that there's a few folks from Formative here, I promise I'm not selling anything, they're not giving me anything other than like a free t-shirt once in a while. Um, but they've been really great to work with and, and, um, and, and it's an amazing tool that I am using to meet my needs. I'm not telling you that's the tool you need to use, but it, it works really nicely for what I'm doing. Um, so, and, and I said the new because they literally, just to, make, just to mess with my head, just released a brand new version yesterday. So when it says new, <laughs> um, it's new. I've been using it for a little while, but it's, it's new to the world. Anyway, sorry. Um, so it gives me data that I can do something with, um, that I can actually act on in real time. Um, it gives instant feedback for students, which as I mentioned, really, really valuable. Um, uh, so I, you can, I've been blogging about that evolution, so if you want to dig more into kind of what my process was for um, improving the model, you can, you can read about it there. Um, so what do they look like now? Um, now everything is on one screen. So um, I embed videos. So I have short videos that I just embed right into the assignment. So they open this assignment up and it's all right there. So there's no clicking and opening 17 different tabs. Um, I try to include short videos. Now, if you look really closely, you can see that video says four minutes and 47 seconds. Too long. I used to train people about creating videos, and the, the sort of rule of thumb was one minute per grade level. So 10th grade, 9th grade, nine or 10 minute videos. Way too long. How many 9th and 10th graders do you know that have that kind of attention span, first of all? <laughs> Not a lot of them do. The second thing is, it needs to be useful. So let's say they watch that 10 minute video and then tomorrow they're kind of trying to solve some problems about that content and they forgot something, they want to go back. Well now they have to scrub through 10 minutes. Have you ever had to try to go find something that was around minute seven or eight but you can't really remember where? It's really inconvenient. So what I did is I just cut them up into little chunks. Try to keep them at one minute. That's my goal. And when I make new ones now, I try to keep them one minute. There may be three or four different videos in the playlist, that's fine label them well, so then the kids can find what they need. So when they come back to it, they know what to go. I mean, just little things like that that make a big difference and make it easier for the kids to get what they need. Um, then I usually include some kind of skills practice, so sometimes for math, that's links to maybe Khan Academy or IXL or whatever tool that you're using. Um, again, that's, so that's on an external site, so they do open new tabs there. I'm actually not even tracking that data. Um, they are told the instructions, and you'll see it in a second, but um, I have them answer a question after they've done that that says, I've practiced this and I feel like I get it and I'm ready to move on, and they just click true, that tells me that they did it. It's, it marks it as right if they mark it as true. Um, 
But the, the point being, I don't need to tell them how much of it to do. If they can do three questions and they're good, great. If they don't need to do any and they can show me in the next step that they get it, great. Right? Let it work for them. Let it work in the way that works best for them. Um, and then they go into more problem solving problems. Um, and this is where you can get into richer, deeper, higher DOK kinds of questions. Um, and, and one of the other things I like about this particular tool that I'm using, you'll notice this is just, um, just a picture or a PDF of something I was already using. Um, and go for it, you could just upload that into the site, uh, literally click and add the questions onto your existing material so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and that's a huge, huge time saver. Um, that's like one of the reasons I, I chose it as a tool. So you can just take a screenshot, photograph, a PDF, a Word document, throw it right in there and add questions. Yeah, okay, we have a few questions. Ah. <laughs> so um, I was going to address this a little bit later, but maybe I'll do it now. I do not assign homework. I like to pause for effect when I say that. <laughs> yeah, um, I stopped assigning homework. Uh, when I started flipping, which obviously means assigning homework, you know, you run into the same things. I'm gonna, I forgot, I did my wireless wasn't working again. You know, all the different excuses that we have and then I had to sort of deal with that. Um, and, and the more I've gotten into this, I realized you know, assigning homework, whether it's assigning a video or assigning these 20 problems, that might be what you need, but that might not be what you need, right? It's all about personalizing it. So I don't assign homework, but that's not to say that I don't expect work to be done outside of class. For some kids, they might just work really slowly through playlists. I have some kids that just, they're so methodical. They watch 10 seconds of a video, they pause, they write everything down, they need a brain break, so they draw a picture and then they go back to it. And so they're gonna progress through it more slowly. That's fine, so that student's probably gonna need to do a little work on just completing their playlists outside of class. Other kids you know, might get home and be like, you know, I was working on this one playlist and there were some problems that I just wasn't quite getting. I need to go back and rewatch that video. If that's what that student needs, great, that's what they do. Um, so they're basically assigning themselves their homework. Um, they do what they need to do. And I have some students from my high flyers who they can just bell to bell, 55 minutes, be on and moving. Great, if they can show me that they've got it and they don't need to do anything at home, then they don't need to do anything at home. It's different for everyone. What does that mean? Sure. <laughs> yeah, open house is my favorite idea. <laughs> it really is because you know we do it in like late September, I think. So we're about like a month or so, maybe a month and a half into the school year. Maybe it's October, I can't remember. And I know what's coming. I only get like eight minutes with, with each group. We like cycle them through our schedule, so I get like eight or nine minutes with each, each group of parents. And that's my moment to explain to them that this is not about their kid being on their computer all the time. If they're sitting in my class staring at a screen the whole time, they're not doing it right. Um, the whole point of this, as I said, is for them to be interacting more with each other to be talking to each other. So sometimes it will start out looking like kids staring at their screens for a couple of minutes, but then they start getting, oh, hey, did you see, did you watch that part of the video? I didn't understand, what did he mean by that? Or I'm trying to solve this problem. How, you know, those organic conversations start happening. And so the kids have all that time to talk to each other, to talk to me. Um, so another piece of that, and this came from feedback from students, some of them really do have an issue with looking at their screen. And so they really wanted printed copies. And so I provide them. So I give them printed copies of all of the resources um, so that they can, and it's really helpful for geometry anyway, because you need to mark up those figures and you need to draw on it. I probably print, I probably get more copies now than I did before I started doing this. Um, because they, they need all of that as a, as a support. And a lot of the kids want it. Not all of them, but, but a lot of them do. Um, did I answer that question? I'm gonna get to that, can I, can I pause that question for a minute and I will definitely address that. Um, so, um, it's a feedback for the students. So this is what, the, what it looks like to the students. Um, so as they put their answers in, informative, it literally within a second or two, it tells them if it's right or wrong by points. Um, and then they also have the status bar up at the top so they can track where they are. And that stays right at the top. So they literally know exactly where they are. I'm talking to you about how they will lose track of their place they cannot lose track of their place. There's literally green and red dots right at the top. So 
um, that's a really cool feature of that. Because um, again, I want it to be easy for the kids to do what they need to do. Um, this is what it looks like to me. So I typically am walking around with my iPad, and I will have a tab with this up. I usually actually have several tabs up because kids might be in different places. They might be in different playlists, so there might be four or five in a unit. Um, so this is what I'm seeing. So I'm getting instant results. So what I can do with that now is I know if kids are falling behind or haven't started yet, <laughs> um, if they're struggling. I also know if a particular question is causing trouble. right? So I see a whole bunch of kids are all struggling with number 17. So I may call those, seven, those five or six <coughs> kids up into a small group to go over that topic. If I see everyone struggling with it, that's where I may stop and have a whole class conversation. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I had a goal this year of trying to almost never talk to the entire class, and I probably took it a little too far. <laughs> I did, and, and, that was, and I'll show you in a little, uh, towards the end some of the feedback I got from some of my students, um, that they, they were wanting that a little bit more, and I think I, I went a little too far with it. Um, but it's, it, I would still prefer to have the same conversation four times in small groups than to do it once to the whole group because, again, it's more personal. I'm finding out what each kid needs in that group. Each kid might have a different misconception. It's a lot easier for them to ask questions that way. Um, but there is a time and place where, like, all right, my video was horrible. Nobody understood <laughs> what was going on. Well, let's just talk about this. And those, those, I need to, I'm going to do that more next year for sure. Um, uh, oh, so just quickly, so. If I see a question like that, you can also just kind of click on the question and see what their answers are. This is not a good example. I couldn't find an example where there were a bunch of wrong answers because they have, they're required in my class to go back and correct them. So when I try to get the screenshot, I'm like, oh, wait, I'm not going to be able to get one that has wrong answers on it because they won't come back and fix them. But you can see, so all seven of those kids made the same mistake. That tells me something. If they all made different mistakes, that might tell me something too. Um, so. You know, this is pretty much what it looks like all day, every day in my classroom. Um, I actually wore out that chair. The, the wheels almost stopped rolling where like I'd push and it wouldn't go anywhere. So I got one of my colleagues to switch with me. She was kind enough because she really didn't need to roll around. Um, but this is what I get to do. And you see I've got my, my iPad. This is that my second one. This is the, the first one that I had uh, you know, four years ago. Um, and, and that's what I'm doing. So I'm watching data and then I'm just talking to kids one on one. And, yeah, they, they're all kind of laughing because I, I couldn't do this organically. I was kind of like, all right, someone just videotape this. I need this for a slide. It's going to be funny. Uh, so um, another thing I'm really encouraging besides self-pacing is for kids to work in their own way, right? There's no reason for, uh, in spite of how horrible our furniture is, I don't know about you, but we're still stuck with those all-in-one desks that are just hideous. Um, they can't even fit a Chromebook and a notebook on them. Um, bigger kids can't even fit themselves in them. <laughs> you know, kids that have bad backs. So my rule is Starbucks seating. Sit the way it works for you. If you want to just sit there normally, that's fine. If you want to bring in a yoga mat and sit on the floor, that's fine. If you want to stand up because you got a bad back, that's fine. Um, the desks are just kind of all over the place in, in different ways. Um, you know, this kind of thing will happen organically sometimes. I have to tell you the story about that picture. <laughs> so I actually was was out. For, I had a half day in the morning to go to my daughter's school for some event, and someone was supposed to be covering my class. I was coming in like halfway through, and I got to the door and I looked in, and there was nobody in the room, no teacher in the room. Oops, <laughs> someone forgot to cover my class, um, and this was happening, <laughs> and I I almost didn't want to walk in. Like they were all working. Like they literally didn't miss a beat. And I'm going to tell you, these are really struggling learners. Um, this is what our classes are leveled, not tracked, but they are leveled. And this was one of my really struggling, struggling groups. And they just made it work. I almost think I need to do that on purpose more often. Just don't show up, and maybe they'll talk to you. <laughs> <separate. laughs> I probably shouldn't uh, show you. Um, and then, I, like I said, some kids had just brought in the yoga mats and would, and would sit on the floor. Um, some kids, like she would a lot of time, would want to just go out in the hall. She just needed not to have other people around her. So she's like sitting outside my classroom in my hallway. I just have to remember to roll out there every once in a while so I don't forget about her. Um, and then sometimes, you know, if we're doing kind of a more whole class, and I do sometimes do whole class activities, that's what this was, where they were all working something together. They were actually working on a collected document at the same time. It was like a Google drawing where they 
were sorting shapes based on um, you know, classifying quadrilaterals. Uh, and they were all kind of doing it together at the same time so that they could be talking to each other and interacting digitally at the same time. Um, so how it works in, for, for my kids um, is I have this planner. Um, this is just a Google spreadsheet. If you didn't know this, I actually discovered this beginning of last year. Any Google document, docs, slides, sheets has an option to do file publish to the web. Did you all know about that? Yeah, okay. Um, kind of amazing. So um, for spreadsheets, I have a tab for each of my classes. So I have a planner that just has like my entire schedule on it. I throw links in there, but then I have a tab for each class. So each class just sees what they need. Um, and so this is literally all they need for my class. Um, so I posted in our, our gradebook system on our little web page in there, which is awful, so they don't like to go on it, but they just bookmark this. And so this has everything, the entire semester. This is just a, a, a small snipping of it, because if I did the whole semester, it'd be like, you know, it'd be tiny and this long. Um, and so they come in, they open up the planner, and they jump to wherever they are. So the question that just, can you put that question back up so I make sure I get it right? Um, about the deadlines. So, let me go back to it actually now. So, oh, thank you. Isn't she so she's awesome? Um, so, here's the problem. I'm the only one in my department doing this. We have common assessments. We have a common curriculum, which is a good thing, right? We're all making sure we're doing the same stuff at about the same time. We can do it in our own way, obviously. They've been perfectly happy to let me do this the way I want to do it. But ultimately, they still need to be ready to take that quiz on Tuesday or on Friday or whenever it is. I can't really change that. Um, I know there, there are models. I mean, the summit schools are kind of doing where kids work through an entire curriculum at their own pace. And you could have kids in front of you that are all, you know, someone could finish geometry in February and then move on to algebra two. That's a whole different kind of school. <laughs> My school is nowhere near even thinking about that kind of thing. Um, so what I do is I self-pace within each unit. So within a unit, so after a test, they start to here they start in circles, right? So day one, everyone is right there, circles of vocab, so that's where they are. And then they, if they finish that on that day, they're going to move on to the next playlist. Um, you'll see that sometimes, oh, not there, but like up here, yeah. So like that trig introduction was a much longer one. Um, I try to at the beginning <coughs> estimate about how long I think it should take them. So I tell them these are soft deadlines. So ideally, you should be finished with that trig introduction playlist by time you get to playlist two days, so on that Friday. Um, if you're not there, that's okay, but just kind of as a check-in, like that's about where you ought to be. Um, I, you know, this is something I do struggle with still because again, I need them to be ready to take the quiz at the end of the week on, on whatever the day is, and so they, they have to catch up at some point. Um, so I want to give them the time to self-pace. I want to let them struggle. That struggle is really important. We know that's really good for their learning that they struggle, right? That productive struggle is, is so powerful. But I do still have that time constraint, which is the question was about, right? So um, I just try to, to let them fall behind if that's what they need, but just try to make sure I check in with those kids, right? So this allows me to check in and have a conversation with almost every single kid every day. I would say I talk to, sorry, was there? I, just for a second, when it says that's for, for checking, yes. what do you mean you need to check in? I can, I'll, get to, I'll answer that in one second. Um, so, so this is something I've struggled with, and I'd, I'd love to hear thoughts about how to sort of address it. So yeah, I will talk to the kids. Hey, you know, you're a little behind. What's going on? Are you stuck? Did you just have a bad day yesterday? What's going on? And, and some kids just are going to wait until the night before and finish it all. And then hey, if they can do that and it works for them, okay. You know, it's, it, it's a hard thing to figure out, and that is something that's still evolving for me that I'm still kind of working on. Um, so, so since you asked about the, the check-ins, so um, this is also something I'm kind of playing around with. So one of the issues that came up was some kids, so, so what happens is if after the soft deadline passes, I put it in the grade book as missing. So they, it's either full credit, a one for full credit, and M for missing, which it counts as a zero. I'm going to change that to NY for not yet. I think maybe psychologically that's better because that's really what it means. And I tell them, like, as long as you finish it, that's cool. I don't really care when. It's full credit whenever you do it. I'm not deducting anything for being late. I mean, it has to, like, when the quarter, when the grades close, obviously, they have to have it done by then. But, um, 
so, so they can kind of do that um, whenever they want. Um, but so some kids, if they have zeros in the grade book, mom's taking car keys away or phones away or they can't go out this weekend and they're in trouble. And so their solution to that, not a lot, but a few kids, their solution is, hey, Johnny, can you show me the answers to that playlist so I can go type them in and get full credit? Clearly not going to help them very much. It's going to take the zero away, but it's going to show up somewhere, right? Because if they don't know what they're doing, um, you know, 90% of our grades is assessment. Uh, so the 10% that's playlist completion isn't really going to help them very much. Um, so I tried adding in these little check-ins. So the check-ins um, I also built in GoFormative, but I set them up rather than giving them the instant feedback. I set it up more like a like a traditional test. So they put their answers in, they submit, and then it tells them how they did. Just as a like, just like, did you really get what you say you got from that playlist? Um, and that way I know if they tried to cheat the system. Um, I'm still kind of figuring out what the best way to do that is, but that seemed to work fairly well. So I could at least catch. You know, if kids did the playlist, they ought to be able to answer these questions, their baseline kind of questions. And if they can't, then I know something went wrong, either for that kid or I missed something in the playlist, so that's another whole class conversation. Did that did I answer your question? Okay. The question if you didn't hear was what do you do with the with the high flyers, the kids who go really fast? Um, that's one of the beautiful things about this. When we talk about differentiation, we're usually talking about differentiating for struggling learners, for kids with disabilities, and trying to figure out how to make it work for them. But we can't forget about the high flyers, right? We don't want them to be bored. We want to challenge them. We want to keep them keep them going. So what I will typically do is just add a section at the end of a playlist, or sometimes at the end of a unit that's optional challenge. I just call it the challenge one. And I, I change the point values to one instead of ten. So when I'm looking on the results screen, I it, they've completed the playlist even if they haven't done those questions, so it makes it easy for me to see. Um, well, what's great about that, I've actually had it happen where I had planned this playlist, I thought it was going to take two days, and someone finished it for like 20 minutes. <laughs> Oops, and I literally didn't have anything ready, so while they were working on it, I was able to go and I had like a, a great challenge problem sort of related to the topic, and I threw it right in there, it pops up on their screen before they even realize it, and then they have something so I try to, it's, you know, those problems that we never have enough time for, um, those really rich kind of challenge, problem solving, puzzles, whatever they are, you could use any way you want. Um, so just add those to the end as optional. So the kids who, you know, stuff that you want them to do, but it's okay if they don't do it. Yeah. Yeah, so as an elementary teacher, um, I have a lot of requests for this as well. I finish fairly quickly, and um, because I teach all of the subjects, not just math, about the formative, the quizzes, what about a summative? How, do you, how does that play into the playlist? Our, our tests are still traditional paper and pencil. So, um, but you do have, you have one at the, at the end of that thing. Yeah, so you know when you see test or quiz there, that's, yeah, sorry, I, I know it's a little small up there. Um, that's traditional, because again, that's common in our department. Um, so, yeah. Do they have access to all the, like, all the playlists at the start? Like, a lot of kids so I, I don't open them up beyond the unit. Um, it's like I said, I don't know what I would do if you know I had kids working on trig here and then someone else had already gone through that and gone through that and moved on to the next. If someone can figure that out for me, and then what do we do with them when they finish the course? Because like there's no structure in place for them to move on to algebra two. You know what I mean? I don't know what I would do. It's an interesting idea, uh, but no, it's the short answer. So I just I open it up. <laughs> What I try to do is have them all posted for the unit, and then I won't make those links. I won't add those links in until after the test is over. What are some
some things that you did to prepare your students for this transition of teaching? Yeah, that's a great question because they definitely need that. Um, some kids just jump right in and it works really well for them. Some kids freak out, I'm not good at technology, I'm not good with computers. You know, one of the things we forget about, like we think, oh, they're young, they're on their phones all the time, they're tech savvy. No, they're not. <laughs> they're not. Like they can tweet and they can Snapchat, great, but that doesn't prepare you for using a, a Chromebook. That doesn't prepare you for managing your notes electronically. It doesn't prepare. They're just like you are. Like some of us are pretty tech savvy, and most of us aren't. Um, so, so you do have to kind of prepare them for that. So, you know, I try to just at the beginning. I do, you know, I, I talk about it a little bit. I think in that video. If I don't, I'm going to add it because it's something I'm constantly working on. But um, just, just talking to them about, look, this is going to be different for you. It's going to take some of you some time to figure out what works best for you. Um, Ask me if you're struggling, if you feel like something isn't working for you, tell me, and sometimes I'll just sort of, all right, if this isn't working for you, why don't you try working this way? You know, maybe work independently first and then work with a partner if the way you do, or whatever those different strategies are. Um, but it, it, that's also something I do kind of struggle with. I will have some students that uh, really do struggle early on, and I sometimes have those conversations with, with parents who give me the, oh, my kid can't learn like this, this isn't right, what are you doing? And then I have to explain to them. And, and I will tell you, I've never once had that conversation with a parent or with a kid and then had them continue to feel that way. Like once you can kind of explain, your kid's getting one-on-one -on -one tutoring in a public school. <laughs> um, you know, they're getting to work at their own pace. They're getting, when they understand that, and when you, you have to explain that to the kids too, right? You have to explain to them like why this is better for and that helps with that as well. Did I, yeah. did I answer? Okay. Um, any others? Yeah. I've got two questions. From what I'm understanding, those traditional paper and pencil tests, everybody can possibly on the same day. Yes. And quizzes as well? Yes. So they're working at their own pace in between those checkpoints. Exactly. And then my next question is, do you translate their progress on their playlist or independent work using a rubric? How do you put that into a report card grade, or are you just using test and quiz grades so the report, our, our department, our school policy, 90% of their grade is assessments, so tests and quizzes. 10% is whatever else. So our policy, what's that? I'm on the Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we could have, probably have an interesting conversation about that. But, um, and if we have time, I'd be happy to get into that. So, so we have, um, yeah, it's 90% is, is assessments. And again, that can look different. It can include like projects and different kinds of things. Okay, then. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I, 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 all forms of assessment. Yeah. Um, but but in, in our math classes, which again we are sort of traditional in terms of the assessments, um, it's it's tests and quizzes. That's pretty much it. Occasional and a few other little things here and there that we've been experimenting with. Um, and then the other ten percent for the other teacher in my department is homework. For my kids, it's playlist completion. So um, did that. Yeah, the way I've been recording it is just complete or not. Um, and once they've done it, it's good. Um, if I design the playlist well enough, then if they complete all the problems I required of them, they should understand what they're supposed to understand. And, and if they didn't, then hopefully those check-ins catch it. The review day will check catch it. Do you feel like you have as much or more buy-in in the system than the way you Absolutely. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some of the feedback I've gotten from students a little bit, uh, a little bit later. So, yeah. It's kind of just like an, you could call it an exit ticket, a concept quiz, something along those lines. But it's just two or three questions um, that are just sort of baseline questions around the topic just to make sure they actually learn what they were supposed to and they don't get the instant feedback. So they, so they have to submit it before they find out if it's right or wrong. All of my playlists, they find out instantly. So as soon as they put the answer in, they have to keep, they have to do it again until they can figure it out or ask questions. But for the check-ins, it's going to be right or wrong. And then I use that data to inform: Do I need to have a, a mini lesson with the whole class about this? Because a lot of those kinds of things. So, yeah. Are you importing your class list using Google Classroom to this? Um, they, at the beginning of the year when I did this, I, they got a, they got a join code. Um, but I believe is the, the Google I Classroom saw that you can. import live now, Travis? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, so you can import them from Google Classroom. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they like that. Um, yeah. You said that you have all your kids correct their problems if they get them wrong. So they literally just go back and rework it. They just keep doing them. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you see, so you can be imagining some kids are clever and they might start trying to just try right. different answers. Or if they're multiple choice questions. Keep trying each one until they get it. So I have to have those conversations with them that, like, look, you're you're not going to be able to do that on the test day, right? You, you have to understand it. So if you miss a multiple choice, and it's something I just have to keep reiterating and talking to them about, like, it's not going to help you. And they learn that pretty quickly. Um, but it is definitely actually an ongoing conversation about, look, you, you've got to make this work for you. You are in charge of your learning. If you're going to just click, click, click until you get it right so you can tell mom you're done, she's not going to be happy when the test comes back and you didn't know how to do this problem. So. Did they keep the red? Like, automatically change to green on that thing? Yep, once they get it right, it changes to green. And it literally happens in real time. Like, a kid be sitting next to me and they change it and it changes within like a half a second or two. So, yeah. um, and then like the check-ins, so I, I talked about the check-ins that I do through formative. I will also sometimes do a kahoot, because we can't do this in one right? Um, I actually went to a session yesterday, and the, the, pers the presenter said I, they didn't like kahoot because I didn't like the music. And I, I literally yelled at him. I was like, I like the music, right? It's fun. You gotta I had the kahoot dance parties where kids, you know, got up. Okay, anyway. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's engaging. I mean, I, what the, the limitation with, with it is the multiple choice part, right? So that's the part I don't love about it. And kids sometimes will just try to click an answer fast without thinking about it. So sometimes I find that while the engagement is high, sometimes it doesn't do what I need. So that's why, depending on what I'm doing, I'll change that up. Um, Socrative, I recently went back to using a little bit because they, they added free response questions that auto grade. Um, so that opened the door, particularly for math or numerical answers and things like that. The same way that formative does. Yeah. When you publish this planner to the web, like you were saying, what you do is it's still a live document, so you can add those links to it as you go. Yes. Okay. So um, when you publish the uh, spreadsheet to the web, it's not instant like it would be if it was just a shared doc. Right. It, it it says at the bottom it can take up to five minutes to push it out. Okay. It usually happens within like a minute or two. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so I kind of already talked about this, so we can skip over. More slide. Um, so we went one to one. So this is our second full year of one to one. Um, so so how many of you are one to one right now? <coughs> okay, so maybe you don't care about this slide, but if you're not, so I mentioned BYOD. That's certainly a way to get around it. So having kids bring their own devices in. Um, and another thing is, you know, small group stations. If you just have the one computer in the corner, you can have kid, you know, a group of students go and work on a playlist for a part of the time. Um, so that you know they they still get a, a piece of that um, ability to work at their own pace, and you know maybe it's a, a skills gap that you need to address. So maybe you have several different playlists that kids can choose from based on where they are. Um, you know, doing that station if you do a station rotation model is really common at the elementary level. Maybe not as common in secondary, but you can certainly do that where you have a group of kids in front of you, another kid, another group of kids working on one computer. If you have a couple, you know, on a computer or iPad. You have. Um, so there are ways to use it, uh, even if you want one. So as soon as you break the device or whatever, does it break that day? Do you allow them to share with a friend just at the same level, or even that day? Yeah. Um, <laughs> after I get, oh, it's not bright red anymore because I'm frustrated. Um, yeah. Sometimes they'll work together with a partner and they'll just write answers down that they're doing. Um, so that they can go put it back into the playlist. Some of them will just do it on their phone. It's another thing I love about the tool, it's totally device agnostic. So it works in the browser on an iPhone or iPad or anything else, so it doesn't matter. I love taking excuses away, and that's one way I do that. So all right, it's a little annoying on the, on the iPhone because it's small, but they can still do it. Um, yeah, so that's. Um, so I wanted to share some of this feedback with you. Um, it's so important that you ask the kids what's working for them and what isn't. Um, I do this two or three times a year with all of my classes, and it is driven almost everything that I do. Um, 
and, and really allowed my, my model to evolve and continue to evolve. Um, some of you find my favorite comment up there. Taking things at my own pace. Yeah. <laughs> if you were thinking I made some of this up, no, this was just copied and pasted. He's a math teacher. What's that? He's a math teacher. That's right. <laughs> um, but a lot of comments about how much they like learning at their own pace. I've had kids who, who failed my class who still tell me that they loved being in it because they loved that ability to work at their own pace, even though they really struggled with it. They still hate maths. I mean, sometimes you can't, can't get rid of that for everybody. I try to get rid of it as much as I can. Um, but they love that ability to self-pace. It's, it's really like life-changing um, for a lot of kids. Um, uh, this was another comment I got, the ability to individually ask questions instead of the whole thing. Some kids just, you're know, never going to hear from them if you're in front of a whole group. Some people just really don't like doing that. That was me. I would have, I hated raising my hand and asking questions in front of the class. So it's much more comfortable because it's one on one and it's small groups. Um, the ability to kind of manage their time in the classroom, like they love that freedom to be treated like a human being. You know, think about what kids do throughout the course of the day school level, you know, sitting in classes for six and a half hours or however long they're there, it's, it's really hard. Um, it's really hard even if you don't have raging hormones and all the other things that high school can, and middle school kids. I'm thinking about, I, I did teach middle school, I taught eighth grade for eight years, so I'm like, I mean, they're all crazy. And they're not the best kids in eighth grade are nuts. And so like, the idea of having them sit in one place for the entire day and listen, oh my god, no wonder they act crazy. Um, you know, and one of the things I will say is my classroom management issues are almost gone because what causes kids to act out? They're bored or they're frustrated because they can't understand the work. And neither of those things really ever happen. They're not bored because they always have something to do. And it's, at the, it's, it's meeting them where they are. Um, and so most of those classroom management issues have just disappeared for me uh, because of that. Which is not, not to say that they don't exist. They certainly do. <laughs> so, um, also ask them what they didn't like about this. This is probably my favorite. I mean, I love getting the positive feedback. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel like things are going well. Um, but I also like this. So, one of the big pieces of feedback I got early on was they wanted stuff on paper. And so, initially, I didn't make printed copies at all. Um, and, and now I make printed copies. And I'm actually thinking next year about having a little packet of printed copies for the entire unit especially for my struggling kids who don't know where their notes were and stuff is everywhere and all that. Literally handing them a packet of the printed copies at the beginning of the unit and it goes right into a free ring binder so it's all there. Um, and if they don't want to use it, they can opt out of it. Uh, if they can tell me they've got another method that works for them. Uh, but I'm considering doing that because I still get so much feedback that they, they need that paper to write on. Um, yeah. Sorry, Hands on projects. Um, Yeah, I mean, and we, we don't do it enough, honestly, but we are trying to, to do more kind of deeper learning activities, a big deeper learning initiative in our district that we're just starting. We just did a big design project, um, you know, kind of trying to incorporate some project-based learning into what we're doing. We really have no idea what we're doing yet, so I we'll have to get back to you on that part of it. Um, but I, I do try to design this, so sometimes that will be either right at the beginning of a unit, probably the best place to do it is the beginning of a unit to kind of create that inquiry and excitement about what they're about to learn. Um, which is really what project-based learning is supposed to do, is the project is supposed to drive the learning, not the other way around. Um, but honestly, we're not, we're not there yet, so I don't have a really great answer. Yeah, yeah that was kind of tied to the question, my client house is kind of the last board of work where you can't really see your stuff to be. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't know, not being a science. Damn okay. <laughs> right, can't answer that. Uh, maybe through flipping, where there might be a video kind of explaining, or however you want to use a playlist. Like, 
these are the things you need to know so that you know when you're coming into it that they're ready for it. I don't know if that. is something. Initially, um, it was just the video, and now if you look at my playlist, they all say, I've watched the video or completed a mini lesson. And so I tell them, if you want a mini lesson, just ask. And so I will provide those. So sometimes after they watch the video, they're like, eh, that video didn't work for me, can you just come? And I'll just grab, hey, I'm doing a mini lesson on this right now, come up to the come up to the smart board and we'll do that. And so five or six kids might come up and do that. Um, so that was really um, kind of powerful feedback. Um, and, you know, Um, so, right, I'm kind of running short on time, so you can kind of go back and read those. Um, I did want to just let you know they're giving away a free trial of their tool. I'm, again, I'm not selling, I'm not getting anything from this, but if you're interested, you can click on that in my slide deck and then use that promo code and they'll let you try out the pro version for free um, for like three and a half months, I think is the, so you can really play around with it. Um, Edpuzzle also, like, they just like contacted me because I was going to mention Edpuzzle, so they're going to give you something free. I don't even know what, but it's in the slide. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, and oh, and then uh, if you would, at uh, when you're done, apparently there's like two different kinds of feedback. Um, there's like presenter feedback and session feedback. I don't know why they would be different, but maybe if there's a lot of sessions. It's free. Um, it's everything that I just showed you is free. They're, they're now introducing a premium version that has extra question types and a standards tracker and all kinds of. When you're done, if you. That's why they just. Yeah. Is there a space where you where teachers can share these sorts of playlists back and forth where we're not recreating the view? Um, they, they formative has the ability to share. So I'm actually, I finally got someone in my department to do it with me. So next year I'm going to be doing Algebra 1 and building that with a partner. Yay, I'm so excited to have someone to do this with me. Um, so yeah, you'll have the ability to, in the, in the free version you can get a share code and then they can make their own copy of the playlist. And I think in the premium version they're going to have some like sort of more collaborative options. Um, Oh, like different for each group. So I don't create a different, well, for different yeah. levels.